So I think without uh, further ado, uh, we will uh, start with our first speaker. Uh, our first speaker tonight is uh, Maggie Stewart. Maggie is a uh, credential diabetes nurse educator, which means that she spends her professional life uh, educating people about diabetes uh, and about how to prevent it. Uh, she's been working here at uh, Baker RDI in our clinics for the last five years and uh, is indeed passionate about uh, helping people to manage their condition. So, why are we talking about diabetes? So, in the world, in 2015, 415 million people had diabetes. It's scary, isn't it? And this relates to 1 in every 11 adults. We predict that in 2040, 642 million people have diabetes, which is 1 in every 10. It's in the world. If we look at Australia in particular, 280 people develop diabetes every day. That's a lot, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, it is. But that's one adult every five minutes. But if you think about it, like that's scary. Around 1.7 million Australians have diabetes. So it's a bit of a problem. Why is this happening? Why are the numbers growing? Well, one of the reasons is because we're all sitting around not doing much anymore. Our jobs will tend to sit at the desk, we don't move. We have remote controls for most things. We don't even get up to change the channel on the TV. We just press a button. We're on computers most of the time. The food that we eat, there's a lot of it. If we go out to the dinner, we're very upset if our plates aren't full. We might need to be really full. And if we go to a restaurant and they don't fill the plate, we think, well, we're going to a restaurant, not going there again. So we all eat too well as well, don't we? And we don't even have to do much to prepare the food. Because you go to the grocery shop, do the grocery shop, and a lot of it's already done for us. This is what the Aussie Health Institute is like. Really good. The reality is more like this. I'm hitting on men today, okay? So the proportion of people who have obese has increased across all the groups over time. It's a bit of a worry, too. So those are some of the reasons why. I'm going to talk about pre-diabetes. So what is pre-diabetes? So you tend to have no diabetes, pre-diabetes, and diabetes. Okay, so no diabetes is when your blood glucose levels are in the normal range. Pre-diabetes is when your blood glucose levels are not in the normal range, but they're not in the range high enough to be diagnosed with diabetes. Another thing that happens with pre-diabetes is something called insulin resistance. So the insulin doesn't work as well as it should. So both pre-diabetes and diabetes are conditions where your blood glucose levels are too high. They're higher than normal. We worry about pre-diabetes because it increases your risk of going on to develop type 2 diabetes. And I think I've said that twice, I think. So I'm just repeating it. Developing diabetes within the next five to ten years, it increases your risk of developing diabetes, type 2 diabetes. It also increases your risk of heart disease and stroke. So we worry about it. Progression to type 2 diabetes, we know, can be delayed or prevented if we make some changes by lifestyle. But it's really important to know about pre-diabetes so that we make some changes to our lifestyle. This is my family's only white food to eat. Okay. So how do we manage with diabetes? What are we going to do about it? So the aim is to reduce the risks. Reduce the risk of going on to develop heart disease and stroke. And to prevent or delay the development of type 2 diabetes. And we want to reduce the risk factors that go on to make us go on to get up to type 2 diabetes. So we want to reduce our weight and we want to increase our physical activity. We want to get up and move a bit. We want to reduce the risk of heart disease and stroke. So the same, the same thing again, because I want that message to get through. We want to reduce the risk. We want to prevent or delay the development of type 2 diabetes, and we want to reduce the risk. By reducing these risks, we can help delay or prevent going on to develop type 2 diabetes and the complications that are associated with type 2 diabetes. Diabetes is a disease characterized by high blood glucose levels. So like I said, 
No diabetes above the percent of the normal range. Pre-diabetes, they're higher than normal, but not high enough for diabetes, and diabetes, they're high. It results from insulin not being made when they're <coughs> So, what is diabetes? <coughs> Just as a car needs fuel, when we use petrol in our cars, our bodies need fuel so that we work, so that we need energy so that we can move and talk and walk and have great many things. And we get that energy from the food that we eat. When we eat food, so carbohydrates, they get digested and the end product is glucose. That glucose goes into our bloodstream as glucose, and that's where we get our energy from. So we eat the carbohydrates, we get digested, glucose from the bloodstream. So, it will go from your head to your toes. In order for the glucose to go into your body cells, you need insulin. Insulin is the key that allows the glucose to go from the bloodstream into your body cells. So it's a bit like, you try and get in this door here, and you have a key to open it, can't get in. So glucose can't get your body cells unless insulin opens the door so that the glucose can get in and give you energy. So in diabetes, what happens is you work, don't produce enough insulin or the insulin that you produce doesn't work well enough. And this results in high blood glucose levels in your blood. It can also mean that the glucose can end up in the wrong place. So it'll end up in your eyes causing that blurry vision that you get sometimes, and it can end up in your kidneys causing damage. So we want glucose to go across from the bloodstream into our body cells to us energy, but not to end up in our kidneys or our eyes. That makes sense? Yeah. If you've got high blood glucose levels, it's going to make you very unwell. Would you agree? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So type 2 diabetes accounts for 85 to 90 percent of people with diabetes. It's influenced by your genetics. So if somebody in your family, like your mum or your dad, had type 2 diabetes, this increases your risk of developing type 2 diabetes. If you sit on the bottom and don't move much and eat all wrong kind of foods, this increases your risk of developing type 2 diabetes. In type 2 diabetes, your pancreas produces insulin, but not enough insulin. And you also will get insulin resistance, so the insulin that you make can't work very well. It happens slowly. So you know that appendicitis, you have an acute pain, you feel like pain, you go to your doctor and you say, hey, I don't feel well. With diabetes, because it's a slow progression, some of the signs and symptoms you get are that you feel tired, when your blood glucose levels get too high, your blood gets thicker so you get more water. When your blood glucose levels get too high, your body tries to get rid of the glucose through your kidneys by making you win. But you wouldn't sort of like to see a doctor if you were feeling tired, because as you get older, you feel tired and we're all very busy. And it happens slowly. If you're drinking lots of food, you think you're going to be winning more, so you want to go to the doctor about that, don't you? But it's not like appendicitis where they get a the pain and it hurts, it happens slowly over time. What are the risk factors for type 2 diabetes? So there are some risk factors which can't be changed and some that you can. So if you've got a family history of diabetes, you can't change that. Nothing you can do about that. You can't change your age. The risk increases as you get older. If I could stop you from aging, I'd be very rich and I wouldn't be here. If you're of Chinese, Indian, Pacific Islander descent and age over 35, your risk increases. If you're Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, age over 35, your risk increases. If you're a man, sorry guys, you're at higher risk than ladies. Women who have diabetes in pregnancy or have large babies are more at risk, and women who have polycystic ovarian syndrome are more at risk. You can't do anything about those risk factors, that's just the way that it is. Things that you can change are your lifestyle. So you can change the amount of physical activity that you do, you can do more. You can change the food that you eat. If your blood pressure is elevated, you can see your doctor and then you can do something about that and help you manage it. 
If your cholesterol is elevated, it's your doctor needs to be done to prevent that. As you put weight on, your waist increases. So if you lose some weight, the waist will decrease and that will reduce your risk. If you smoke, that increases your risk of diabetes as well. So you can reduce your smoking and hopefully quit. Everybody should be screened for diabetes if they are at high risk of developing diabetes. And here are the people who are considered at high risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So anyone who's got pre-diabetes, so a blood glucose level that's not normal but not high enough to be considered diabetes should be screened. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders aged over 18 should be screened. All people aged 40 should be screened using the Austin risk form. That's a form that was added to the front, and, and it might ask, ask you questions like, are you male or female, how long are you, etc. Because you'll score to tell you the risk of developing diabetes in the next five to ten years. People who are aged 40 with a BMI of over 30, women with insulin diabetes in pregnancy, women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, particularly overweight, those with the first degree relative with type 2 diabetes, and anybody taking antipsychotic medication is at increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. This is the Austin risk form that you can fill out. You can get this from your GP as well, and it's a good thing to fill it out, and if you are going to be high risk, those should you please ignore this and screening for you. So what you will usually order is a fasting blood glucose test. So the fasting blood glucose is less than 5.5, diabetes is unlikely. If you're at high risk, you'll be screened again in a year. If you're at moderate risk, you'll be screened again in three years. If the fasting blood glucose is between 5.5 to 6.9, that means you've probably got pre diabetes, but to make sure they'll order an oral glucose tolerance test, which is where you'll drink that horrible glucose syrup. The two hour levels, if they're less than 7.8, diabetes is unlikely. If the two hour level is between 7.8 to 11, that means you've got pre-diabetes. And if the um, two hour level is more than 11.1, it means diabetes is likely. If your fasting blood glucose is more than seven, that means diabetes is likely. So if you go to GP who does a random blood glucose and it's more than 11.1, that means diabetes is likely. If you don't have signs and symptoms of diabetes, they'll probably do another test just to make sure. <coughs> Why do we treat diabetes? The reason that we treat it is because high blood glucose levels increase the risk of damage to your blood vessels. But when you've got glucose in your blood that's too high, it will cause damage to the blood vessels. Because you've got blood going from your head to your toes, it can cause damage from your head to your toes. So it's really important to try and keep diabetes under control to your blood glucose levels lower so that you reduce the risk of these. But some of the things that can happen is it increases your risk of heart disease and stroke, diabetic eye disease, kidney problems, nerve problems with your feet, or gum disease and tooth decay. So really important to look after your mouth and your oral hygiene. So making sure that you brush your teeth twice a day is really important. If you eat something sticky, have a glass of water, and go and see the dentist regularly. What are the aims of the treatment? We know that it can cause damage, so how do we help manage that? So, it's a good idea to end the blood glucose between 6 to 8 before meals and between 8 to 10, 2 hours after meal. No point checking your blood glucose an hour after a meal because you'll still be elevating. So, before a meal or 2 hours after, it's a good time to check your blood glucose levels. If you want a HbA1c of 7% or less, so HbA1c is a blood test your doctor will order, and it just tells you the average diabetes control over the last three months. We know that if it's less than seven, it reduces your risk of going on to develop complications. And this should be done in three to six months. And we want to prevent or detect early any signs of complications so we can do something about it before it becomes too bad. So, what is the complication screening that we do? What do we recommend? So, every three to six months, they get your blood pressure checked. 
one of blood pressure of 140 or 90. If you have some kidney disease, you might want it lower, maybe 130 or 80. A good idea whenever you go and see a GP to get your blood pressure checked, just to see what it is. If you get um, white coat hypertension, which is when your blood pressure goes up and you see the doctor, it's a good idea to go to the pharmacy and get them to check it for you. There's quite a lot of pharmacists will do that, and then you're not as stressed and it will tell you all the Get your weight and waist checked to make sure you're not putting on lots of weight or losing weight. And get your feet assessed. So you need to check that your feet are okay because you've only got two and you want to look after them. You want them to last you for years. So what they're going to check with your feet is that you've got protective sensation. What that means is if you stand on something and it hurts, you're going to move your foot. If you can't feel it, you're going to stand on something, you're not going to move your foot and the damage will be done. You want to prevent any wounds or things like that. And also to check the pulse is to make sure that the blood supply to your feet is good. Every 12 months, you should get your blood levels checked. So that's your cholesterol. You want your total cholesterol to be less than four. Your HDL cholesterol, which is a good cholesterol, which I think of as a little Pac-Man, to be more than one. And that little Pac-Man goes up and it's all bad cholesterol. The LDL cholesterol and the triglycerides are bad cholesterol. And they cause gum to go around your blood vessels, which makes it harder for the blood to go through. And that little HDL will go along and eat it up. So you want the HDL to be higher, and an LDL will try to be to lower. You want to have a urine test every 12 months. This is to check if your kidneys are okay. So sometimes your kidneys might leak a little bit of protein. But it's different to the protein you get if you're in an tract infection. It's just a minuscule amount of protein that feels sort of lined in there, that your kidneys are struggling a little bit. But it's just your weeds or a cock that goes off to pathology, and now there's no percent of urine there. And you can not doing any protein there. An eye check. So if you get an eye check done every 12 months, you can do that with an optometrist. It doesn't have to be an ophthalmologist. An optometrist will refer you on if there's a problem. If you've only got two eyes, and want to make sure you're looking after them. They're not looking at whether you need glasses or not. They're looking at the back of your eye, at the retina, to see if there's any diabetic retinopathy. If there isn't, there's something to bang to. The trouble is, by the time you get signs and symptoms, it's too late. So you need to go so they can have a look. And also a dental check, as I said before, looking after your oral hygiene, really important. So why? Why do we do all this? The benefits of doing something, changing your diet and your lifestyle, having the complications to what you need to help prevent the things that we hear about all the time in the telly. So we want to help prevent heart attacks and stroke because these are four times more likely in people with diabetes. We want to help prevent eye disease, which is one in five times more likely in people with diabetes. We want to help prevent kidney disease, kidney damage, which is three times more common in people with diabetes. And we want to help prevent amputations, and that's 15 times more common in people with diabetes.